and looking at the passage. Father, um, certainly you're worthy of all praise, all honor, and all glory. And Father, as we look at your word, we, we surely get to see a glimpse of your glory and a glimpse of your wisdom. And Father, I just pray that this morning, that as we look at your perfect word, that we'd understand what we have in your word, that it is infallible, that it will not fail at any point, and that we can trust in it with all of our heart, that we can live our lives and conduct ourselves according to what you have written to us, and for us to be able to to put aside what the world thinks or what the majority has to say, but that we would focus and understand that what you say is right, and it should be our only uh, path for us to, to walk down. It should be our, the light in which we live our lives. And Father, I just pray that we would see that this morning. Father, I pray that you would allow me not to get in the way of this message and that uh, your word and your, uh, your truth would shine forth and do its perfect work in the, in the hearts of those who have come this morning. We just ask for, for the, the grace of, of me conveying this clearly and in ways in which can be easily understood. Father, be gracious to us now as we look at your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 8, where Paul says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, and every man be found a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words, and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. Well, as we began to talk about last week, it is very common as a teacher and preacher of God's word, to have your words twisted, to have them skewed, to have them taken out of context by your opponents. They will oftentimes claim that you're saying something that you never said. They they read into your statement or they read into a particular position that you might hold and they begin concocting a false conclusion of what you meant or the implications of that. They are the type of people who instead of listening to what you're trying to convey, they instead are the ones who are, who are thinking in their minds how they're going to refute what you are saying while you're saying it. They're trying to trip you up, catch you in your words, it's the same thing that the Pharisees would try to do to Jesus over and over again. Contemplating on how they might set a trap for Jesus for them to get him to say something that would condemn himself or that would be inaccurate or inconsistent with Scripture. They are the people, after hearing a sermon, who basically sit around and create a, a false narrative regarding what has just been preached. And they continue to go off in these dangerous directions with the words of the preacher that he never actually said, as they implement unbelieving, false human logic. And in the process, what they end up doing, as Paul talks about there in verse 7, is they end up slandering the preacher. 
as false accusations are thrown around, these being unholy objections that are essentially girded with bad intentions. This is what I was pointing out last time. Historically, these are really looked at as just plain objections. But as I pointed out, I think it's better to understand what's going on here is that these are actually more of accusations by his opponents, mostly and probably Jewish opponents. Those people who he ends up saying in Romans 11 are the enemies of the gospel, where they are looking for a reason to refute what Paul is teaching, what he is saying. They do not want to accept it. And so then they create these objections. They slander Paul by saying that he teaches something that Paul isn't teaching. And I brought up an example last time, and there there are other examples to help us understand this. For instance, if I were to, as I commonly do, teach on the doctrines of grace or teach on the sovereignty of God in salvation, well, then there can be opponents who would then naturally say, well, you know, Brandon, he's anti-evangelism. He's, he's anti-missions. Because in their mind, they, they make this deduction that is a false deduction about that because they think that if God is sovereign and electing his people unto salvation, that somehow then it doesn't matter if you evangelize the lost. It does not matter if you are involved in missions. Those things don't matter. Even though... Those are things that I never said. Actually, I didn't even allude at all of those truths and teach contrary to what their accusations are. But this is something all the time. Or they say, well, if you teach that, then you just believe and that Brandon just teaches we're all a bunch of puppets. We're all a bunch of robots. God has already, if he's already decreed the end from the beginning, then what is the purpose of us doing anything? That they become fatalist and that they accuse you of being the same way, which is absolutely not true. Or there's other things that, for example, there's been times I've been called or referred to as somebody who is a legalist. And what they, when they make these accusations and they don't even know what the word means, they don't even know what that, what that word means at all, meaning that you are trying to justify yourself by your own works or, or keeping the law of some sort. But they say that because you actually believe what the Bible says. Like, well, I actually, when I read what God has written in His Word, I actually believe it, and I actually believe we should obey it. It doesn't mean you're a legalist, but your opponents or or people who want to disagree with you can come up with these type of narratives, and they push these narratives. And this is exactly what Paul is dealing with within this passage And we sometimes think that this is something that's only common today. That these unbelieving critics are only kind of these newly invented creatures. They're they're kind of the beast of our modern times. And that it was not the case with the early church. They didn't have these types of problems. As if somehow we think that mockers and scoffers didn't exist in the first century. But that line of reasoning is not well suited for these student of scripture for those who dismiss and ridicule god's word are as old as the serpent's hiss and were just as common in paul's day as they are in our time and as i mentioned this is exactly the kind of people that paul is addressing in verses one through eight he's not addressing sincere questions that might be raised by those hearing the gospel He's not responding to well-meaning and genuine seekers of the truth. He's responding to his enemies and their unfounded accusations that they've been going around levying against Paul's preaching. And all this is, is their carnal reasoning. And he's doing this for the church in Rome's sake. Paul thinks it's necessary to to point out, to quickly address these ridiculous accusations. He doesn't want his beloved in Rome to be confused by any of these arguments that that might come up. As if they are in the, the town square and all of a sudden some kind of Jewish enemy of the gospel starts raising these objections. He wants them to be well prepared for them. 
He doesn't want them to be confused. He doesn't want them to be caught off guard. He doesn't want them being tossed to and fro. But instead, he wants his people, the church in Rome, to be anchored in the truth, to understand these arguments that are being levied. And let's just remind ourselves a little bit about this outline here. I talked about before there are really eight questions that are posed here within these eight verses that are what Paul says the opponents are saying about them. This is their, their questioning. These are their arguments, and there are four pairs of them. And each pair makes up an argument that he addresses. So a good way to look at this is in the odd verses, you have the objection. You have two questions that make up the objection. Then in the even verse, you have Paul's response or his rebuttal to that particular um, objection or accusation that they have. And that's a pretty consistent way of looking at it. Verse 7 and 8 kind of mess that up a little bit, but you still have the two questions with the answer. It's just that one of the questions are within verse 8. But as we established last week, Paul would certainly have known what all of these objections or accusations would be. As Paul would spend his life going from city to city, from synagogue to synagogue, and there he would be preaching the gospel. He'd be trying to, as we read through and looked at Acts, he would try to reason with them out of the scriptures why Jesus is indeed the Christ, their long-awaited Messiah. So he's heard it all. As he would go from, from Athens and would go to Thessalonica, as he would go to, to Ephesus, no matter where he went, he would hear these certain objections and accusations. Or he would just simply be arguing in the streets or talking to people and somebody might come up and he says, you know what so-and-so is saying about your teaching? You know what's going on here? They said this, that you said this. Is that true? Or is that really what you said? And so he would have to deal with these accusations that exist as he would reason. And we dealt with this first one when we looked at verses 1 and 2 last week. And I just want to briefly go through that accusation that's made. It kind of goes like this. is what is really his opponents are getting at in verse 1. And remember, this is all in response to what would normally happen when he would teach similar things as he taught in chapter 2 when he's trying to condemn all men. He would be saying things like, Paul, are you, are, are you really saying that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile? What's the, what's the point of being Jewish, being the chosen people of God? What was the point of him delivering us the law? What's the point of us being the covenant people of God and being circumcised? From the way you talk, Paul, one might think that it's actually a disadvantage to be a Jew. I mean, you say that there's greater condemnation for us who reject. Are you really saying, Paul, that there's no advantage, that there's no benefit in being a Jew? And of course, Paul's response then in verse 2, he's pretty much getting at the point. Listen, I never said that there was no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. I never said that there was no advantage in being a Jew. I never even alluded or implied that there's no advantage. There is absolutely an advantage of being a Jew. And then he goes in. First of all, they've been entrusted with the very oracles of God. They've been entrusted with the scripture. And we talked about the great advantage that that would provide for the Jewish people. Because within the scriptures is contained the wisdom that leads to salvation. It was always and has always been about Jesus Christ. It has always been pointing to him. It has been a great advantage to them. And it's the same advantage that the church enjoys now. As they have been entrusted, they have become ambassadors of this very word as the people of God. But then he moves on to his second objection or accusation. Again, here we see again two questions in verse 3 that make up one objection. Remember our outline as we went through it. Verse 3, what then, first question, 
If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? So let's just kind of back up here. What, what is he, when he is quoting this, when he is, he's putting these questions forward, we have to ask ourselves, well, what's he getting at here? What's, what's the heart of this particular accusation that they're making? So let's just start off here by identifying some key points before we get too deep into what is going on here and explain this accusation. And the first one that I want you, that we need to identify here is that within the second question, he uses the language some there, if some, and then he refers to that he has this plural pronoun here, their belief. So the question is, who is the some and their that is being referred to and talked about here by Paul? What's the subject matter here? He's not talking about the unbelief of the entire world, is he? No, that's not what he's talking about here. The some and the there there is obviously in context here, the Jews. This is, this is what we're talking about. This was his accusation at the end of chapter 2. This is again what he's talking about here within the context here. And it's important for us, to, like you might be sitting there and think, well, that seems obvious. But I read quite a few commentaries, and I listened to uh, and read a couple uh, people preach on this particular passage, and they're not clear on that. They start applying this to everybody. But it's clear to me that in, within context here, this is referring to the Jewish people here. He then goes on, and there's a second thing we need to notice. And it's the first question. The first question is simply, what then? And from my estimation, this is a question that ties the new objection to the previous one. The previous answer was that the Jew had a great advantage with possessing the scriptures. Because in those scriptures is the wisdom that leads to salvation. As I mentioned, it all points to Christ. Yet as the objection goes, as this objection goes, there are some Jews who do not believe. Actually, there is a lot of Jews who do not believe. And the issue that is raised here by Paul's opponents obviously has to do with the fact that in those oracles, there is something promised to Israel. In their mind, there's something there within those oracles that does lead to an advantage in their mind for Israel. An advantage that God has promised eschatological salvation for Israel. So this is how I think the objection goes here. If we are going to, to, to back up. They're saying, Paul, we absolutely agree that being entrusted with the oracles of God presents an advantage for the Jew. We're actually glad you brought that up. Paul, you of all people should know that in the scriptures, in these oracles, God has promised salvation to Israel. You say that we don't believe and are faithless because we've rejected that Jesus is our Messiah and have crucified him. So are you saying, Paul, that God is not faithful in keeping his promises? Are you concluding that God has violated his covenant with Abraham? Are you saying that God is a liar? And I think this is, gets at the heart of the argument or the accusation that these Jews would bring against Paul. It would go something like that. As they are accusing Paul of teaching that God is not faithful in keeping his promises. That they're basically saying, Paul, you're teaching something that is completely contrary to what is written in the scriptures. And of course, this topic is a very important topic throughout the book of Romans. Actually, Paul will spend about three chapters talking about the relationship between the covenant promises of God with Israel in the midst of their present disobedience and trying to explain what's going on with that. So he's going to spend a lot of time expanding upon this particular issue in this book. But I, I do want to step back and I, I want to look at some of these promises that God has made to Israel. I want to, 
I want for you to see the verses that would have been on the minds of Paul's opponents that they're thinking about when he says to them, listen, your unbelief is going to cause you not to enter into the kingdom of God and you are going to suffer an eternity in hell. And they're like, well, how can that be? How can that be? God says he's going to save Israel. For instance, Isaiah 45, 17. Israel has been saved by Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. You will not be put to shame or humiliated to all eternity. They're thinking about passages like that. Actually, turn with me to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Now, if any of you have been coming on Wednesday nights, we have been doing a study in the book of Joel, and it just happened that some of the subject matter that we are looking at today has intersected with what we were looking at within the book of Joel, and we spent a lot of time Wednesday night actually in this passage in Zechariah chapter 12. For we have to understand that in Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14, we have this prophecy given about the future of Israel and what's going to take place at the end of the age. And within Zechariah chapter 12, it starts out by talking about that someday there is going to be a siege upon the city of Jerusalem. The nations are going to gather and they're going into conflict against Jerusalem. But then we see that in one of Israel's darkest hours, that the Lord Jesus will come and he will deliver Israel. Verse 8 of chapter 12, you'll see there it says, In that day Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of Yahweh before them. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The tie there from what we're looking at in Joel is the idea in Joel chapter 3. It talks about the judgment that will take place in the valley of Jehoshaphat, where all the nations gather. And there God will judge the nations. Here, this is the same idea that's being talked about here. But then, always tied to this, is this pouring out of the Spirit that is tied to new covenant promises upon Israel. And so then, this idea, as Paul will talk about, and we will see in Romans 11, that all Israel will be saved at that point. And you will see there in verse 10, this promise. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadadrimen in the plain of Megiddo. So if you just kind of back up here, what we see here taking place is is that one time in the future, Israel is going to look back on the one whom they pierced, who's whom? It is Jesus. That's a reference to the cross. That connects to what is said in Isaiah 53, when he will be pierced through for our transgression and talking about the Messiah. They are going to look back on the one whom they pierced and they are going to mourn. They are going to understand that they crucified and rejected their Messiah. The Spirit of God is going to do a great awakening in the hearts of the nation of Israel in that time, and thus all Israel will be saved. You even see as it goes on into chapter 13, verse 1, In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. This can refer to no one else besides ethnic Israel. It can't be applied to the church. It has to be applied to Israel. These are the ones who will be in Jerusalem in those days. The inhabitants will be there. There will be this revival that takes place, this refreshing 
that goes on. And then as you move into verse 8, it says, It will come about in all the land, this is of chapter 13, It will come about in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, and the third will be left in it. Two-thirds of the Jews in that time, under the siege, they will perish, they will die. The third that is saved, they will then call upon the name of the Lord. They will believe. That's what it goes on there in verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire. Refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, Yahweh is my God. There's no doubt the connection here. That is new covenant language. That is, that is a language that's used to describe the covenant, the new covenant that God has made with Israel that was ratified by the blood of Jesus upon Calvary's tree. That is what that is referring to. Of course, there's, there's other passages Psalm 14, verse 7. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When Yahweh restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Turn with me also to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. In verse 31. I just want to take you to one of the places within the Old Testament where the new covenant exists, these oracles of God, this promise that is given to Israel. And in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, you see it said there, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh. It's talking about in the future. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. So we see right away, he's making a distinction here. He's saying, this isn't like the conditional promise and covenant that I made with you at Sinai. There he's talking about the Mosaic covenant. It was a conditional covenant. They entered into it with them. Blood was shed, and they, the, the, the law was read, the, the terms of the covenant was read. Israel said, we will do all of these things as the blood was, was splattered or, or sprinkled upon the people. They entered into the covenant. They had a condition, they had a term on their end that they had to keep. Here it says they broke that term. Because it was a conditional covenant. He says here that this covenant, this new covenant, is not like that. It's an unconditional covenant. It does not depend upon the belief of Israel. It does not depend upon what they are doing at any particular time. It's something God says he will do. And you'll notice this here. He says, you'll notice if you would just glance through verses 31 through 34, you'll see all of these, I will. God says, this is what I'm going to do. This is, and this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to bring forth. This, this covenant's much like the Abrahamic covenant. It's unconditional. This covenant's much like the Davidic covenant. It's unconditional. As he goes on to say, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. This is, again, is another important point. It's with the house of Israel. It's a corporate covenant. It's a national covenant. It's not an individual covenant with each individual person. It guarantees the future salvation corporately of Israel. He goes about to say, After those days, declares Yahweh, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh. They will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. These are the exact things that are in the minds of the Jewish opponents. They bank on those promises. They they believe that part of Scripture. 
They believe in the reality. This is what's on their minds. These are what these Jews are holding on to when they say this. But here's Israel's great miscalculation in all of this with these Jews. Here's his accuser's fatal flaw. Their their ruinous reckoning. Their egregious error. Okay, I'm done. They've somehow imagined that because of God's unconditional promise to Israel, that somehow that guaranteed the individual salvation of each Jew within Israel. Does that make sense? What they did was they took this, this corporate and national unconditional promise to Israel as a whole that's going to take place in the future, and they tried to apply that to them individually. But the problem is, there's no individual Jew who has ever been promised salvation apart from what? Repentance and faith. That is the necessary terms. Their advantage ended up being no advantage because they ended up rejecting Christ. They lacked true faith in God's word, which was, again, all about the coming Christ. And because of that, the oracles of God ended up serving as a having no saving advantage to them. It's much like as what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 2, when he says, For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, the the gospel preached to us, just as they also, who is they also in that passage? That is the, the unbelieving Jews in the wilderness who were delivered and brought out of the land of Egypt. But then he goes on to say this, But the word they heard did not profit them. It was of no advantage to them. Why? Because it was not united by faith in those who heard. That is what is necessary and needed. So this becomes the fallacy of their argument. This is their their carnal reasoning that's being washed up on shore. As the inevitable future salvation of Israel should have provided no security to the individual Jew, ever. Now, let's look at Paul's response to this accusation, since we've kind of set it up and understood what's going on in their mind. Because, remember, let's, let's kind of go back. They're, they're teaching that God, basically, that Paul's saying God has reneged on all of his promises. They're, they're saying that Paul teaches that God is unfaithful this is where they go in their mind by this by them being condemned by told being told they're condemned for not believing they're kind of like what are you saying paul just because we don't believe that jesus is the christ that we're going to be going to go to hell and be left out of the kingdom of god are you saying that god is not going to keep his word and here's his response in verse four to that May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. May it never be. Very strong word here within the Greek language. It's actually the strongest negative, and it's a very emphatic negative in the Greek language. Meganoito. Old translations would say things like, would translate this, God forbid. But it may be better thought of as, as this emphatic, we might say, impossible. Or, or this emphatic, inconceivable. There is no way. This is not happening. We might even say in a common vernacular, in kind of a crude way, we might say, when hell freezes over. That might be a good way to, to, to capture the idea here of, of what's being said. It's, it's not going to happen. God will always be faithful. This is horrible logic. And Paul then goes on to, to get his point across by communicating the idea by making an immutable statement about God and a universal statement about man. When he says, rather... Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. And in the context here, the idea here is God will always keep his promises. God will always be faithful. 
Paul is saying that God is always right. Even if the whole world disagrees with God, God's still in the majority. You never come to the conclusion on a subject matter, if it is true or not, based upon the amount of people that either agree or disagree. Guess what? It doesn't matter. That doesn't speak to the truthfulness of the reality. Most of the time, the majority is actually wrong on the matter. Every man is a liar, Paul says. What you must believe is what God says. What he has revealed in his word. And never doubt the veracity of it. Never doubt the accuracy of it. Never doubt the validity of it. Who cares what independent fact checkers have to say about what God says? Who cares about what polling numbers say? Who cares about what man says ever? What matters is what God says. He that plainly speaks in his word. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? So what Paul's doing here is stating this immutable truth about God and this, and this universal truth about man and him appealing to God's covenant faithfulness. Saying, he remains true to all of his promises. You know those promises that God made to Abraham when he was 99 years old and without a covenant child? He's going to keep every last one of them. You know those promises that he made to King David? The promise that his son, a descendant of his, would sit on the throne of Israel, a throne and a kingdom that God said that he will establish forever? Remember those promises? Not one will go unfulfilled. You know the new covenant that God made with the house of Israel. The promise of future salvation. The promise of the pouring out of the Spirit of God upon the nation. The promise that the desolate land will become like the Garden of Eden. You know those promises? Good is fulfilled. Why? Because God's promised them. That's why. For He is by nature not only a promise maker, but He's a promise keeper. And Paul says, and by nature, you are all a bunch of liars. That's exactly what is being communicated. It doesn't matter if the whole world declares with one solidified voice that Israel's done, that they have no future in God's plans. It's still going to come to pass. And at that point, then, God will be justified. He will then be proven right and the whole world will be what? Wrong. And of course, Paul strengthens his argument by quoting Scripture. Interesting enough, by quoting what David said in Psalm 51, verse 4. That you, being God, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Now let's just kind of back up and let's look at the fuller context here of this passage that Paul uses from Psalm 51. Many of you are very familiar with this psalm. It is David's penitential prayer. It's a, it's a penitent prayer after he has confronted by Nathan over the scandal that he has with involving the affair with Bathsheba and then ultimately arranging the death of her husband, Uriah the Hittite, and trying to cover all of his sin up he finally comes to his senses and he repents before God. He pours out his heart. He confesses his sins. He pleads for pardon. And here's the entirety of verse 4, where David says, Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And then the second half, with which Paul quotes, So that you are justified when you speak and blameless. When you judge. Obviously, if you pay close attention there, you'll notice that there's a slight difference in reading from reading it in Psalm 51 and then reading it in Romans chapter 3. 
That's oftentimes because Paul, what he normally does is he quotes out of the Greek Septuagint when he quotes the Old Testament within the New. So then you're basically getting a, a translation of a translation there that ends up in our text. But the same point is communicated. So here the idea is that God is justified by his words or when he speaks. What that is doing is conveying the idea that eventually he'll be vindicated in his words. He will be proven to be right. That in the end, every word of God that he has spoken and given to us will be exonerated. It will be proven true. And then he says, and then prevail when you are judged. That in judgment, this truthfulness will triumph. It will be victorious. All of man's lies, all of man's unfaithfulness, all will be exposed and judged according to God's word. So let's just paraphrase and let's just say this is how Paul is responding to this accusation here by what we've just went through. Paul says, there you go again. Saying, I said things that I never said. Making wild accusations against me. Just because I said you Jews are condemned because you reject Jesus as the Christ because you do not believe does not mean that I said that God does not keep his promises to Israel. That is only something that you've invented in your own mind. God absolutely will keep all of his promises to Israel despite the unbelief of this generation of Jews. God will always keep his promises. God will always remain faithful. If God has said it, it is good as done. The unconditional promises of God will never fail. Just as Paul will say later in his second letter to Timothy in chapter 2 verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the exact argument that Paul is going to make later in this letter to the church in Rome. If you would go to Romans chapter 9, and you would see the first five verses there that we've looked at several times in talking about the advantages that the Jews enjoyed. You will notice there, That after going through all of those advantages, those them being having the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, he kind of goes on and on and runs them off there. He then says this, starting in verse 6. So what I want you to do is think about the orientation of his argument here within chapter 9 that's very similar to what he's doing back in Romans chapter 3. He just is going to greatly expand on it later. Because then he goes in, after naming all those advantage, he goes, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. That's so important there to notice that he says that that way. Again, his word, he's saying, is infallible here. It's not going to fail. Israel's current unbelief is not going to nullify the promises of God. He goes on then to say, and he makes sure that he points out, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. He starts going through and making this argument that just because you are um, ethnically Israel, because you are of the bloodline, that direct descendant, doesn't mean that you are of Israel in the saving sense, because you don't have faith. As he will establish back in Romans chapter 4, this has always been about being justified through faith. That is the only way in which man can be right before God. That is the way God has always saved his people. And so then he he goes and makes this argument then in talking about how it's his sovereign choice of who then he will show mercy upon when talking about Israel at this present time. It's God's sovereign choice. He then goes on in Romans 11, if you would kind of jump forward there. He never really abandons this argument. It continues through. And then in verse 1, he says, I say then, 
God has not rejected his people, has he? And there it is again. Meganoito. May it never be. That very strong negative. And then in verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. He's going to go on and continue to make sure that we understand that God is not someone who reneges on his promises. This could even be something that we could struggle with. If There's a lot of people who believe in this idea of, of replacement theology, that, that the church has permanently replaced Israel as the people of God, and they have given up all of the benefits. Well, that would be create a bunch of confusion. Well, then does... God renege on his promises. Is he not going to keep his promises that he gave to Abraham? It's not what's happening here. He then goes on and makes this point in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 25. Where he says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. He says here that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. He's saying there that there's, during this time that Israel has been hardened to reject Christ, to reject the gospel, but it's only a partial hardening. Paul's already made the argument here within this section that, that not, he has not rejected all of Israel. It's only partial. He says, I'm an example of that. I'm a Jew and I believe I have been saved by this grace. He has shown mercy to me. So, so, so there's only a partial hardening that's happened. But this, there's, a, there's a time element here. Until. This partial hardening is only going to exist for a limited time. It's only temporary. It has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Until all of the elect Gentiles are saved throughout the church age. Until that point, and then after that, this partial hardening will be removed. As we read about in Zechariah chapter 12, where God will pour out his spirit, and there will be complete fulfillment of the new covenant. He then goes on here, verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. All Israel during that time. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul then goes back. He just doesn't say all Israel will be saved. He's actually saying here that what his opponents were thinking, they're right in a sense. They, their expectation that all Israel will be saved was a right expectation. It's going to happen in the future. And then he goes on in verse 28. After referring to Scripture and going back there to make his argument, he says, From the standpoint of the gospel, they, the Jews at that time unbelieving, are enemies for your sake. He's probably talking about his objectors here in chapter 3. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture, for the gifts of and the calling of God are irrevocable. He's saying he can't take them back. They're for keeps. His promises are everlasting. They will not fail. God's word will not fail at any point. There's no weak link in God's speech. There's no fault in the foundation of God's word. You need to listen. We must understand something. God never outpromises himself. God never overcommits. He doesn't write checks he can't cash. He doesn't overpromise and underdeliver. Our God is always faithful to his word. He's always faithful to his promises. And to the believer, to those who are trusting in his words, I have to tell you, the idea and reality of that are some of the most comforting thoughts imaginable. That God has not overpromised. That God has not oversold himself. That God's just not being hyperbolic about his promises. Just think about some verses in the context of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 but just as is written, 
Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him will not fail. Infallible, not overpromising. The expectation then that should arise in the hearts of those trusting in Jesus. Or consider Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. What a great promise for us as we go through a world of suffering and difficulty. Or John 14, verse 1, where Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. And here is Jesus acting as the great bridegroom, going to prepare a place for, in preparation for the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Or even what is said in Job chapter 19, verse 25. As for me, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last He will take His stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. Comforting truths that will not fail. The hope of Job that one day, that even though that he knows that he will die and he will be put into the ground, but that one day he will be resurrected and his own eyes will behold the glory of our God. God's not overselling and under-delivering. These are promises that we can hold on. These these are things that when we are believing them like we should be, be believing them, they are dripping with hope. Great hope. But then there's always the other side of the coin, isn't there? On the other hand, the unbeliever, those who do not love God in this contact, these are some, these are some of the most frightening thoughts imaginable that God does not underdeliver. That God does not overpromise. I mean, he's not, like, he's not like sometimes us as parents where we make empty threats to our kids. Like, you better watch out, you're going to get it. Even though you know that you know, you're really not going to do nothing, you're just threatening them to try to manipulate them to get them to do something. God's not like that. God never says an empty threat. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Or consider what is said in Matthew 13, verse 41. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and He will throw them into the furnace of fire, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen, no matter how men respond to His promises, He will be absolutely faithful to keep all of his promises. Whether the promise is eternal life and the forgiveness of sins for those who love him, for those who believe upon Christ crucified, or an eternity of torment and endless suffering in the lake of fire for those who have had not the faith that is necessary to have Christ's righteousness credited to their account. For all of those promises, as Paul says, are irrevocable. 
And the question is, how are you going to respond to those promises? Are you going to be guilty as these unbelieving Jews are guilty by only believing the parts of Scripture that they wanted to believe? Because if they would have believed the fullness of the oracles of God, they wouldn't have rejected the Christ. They would have believed. They were hearing and hoping in what they wanted to hear and hope for. They, they looked at their Scripture as if it was something that they could go into and they can take from it what they like. And I like that. But you know what? I really don't like this part. So we're going to kind of say that that part doesn't really count. God doesn't really say what he says in this section. We're going to come up with some way to say that he's saying something different here. No. That's not how it works. The question is, are you going to believe his word? Or are you just going to completely dismiss it as nonsense? Are you going to truly believe that God's word will not fail? Or are you going to continue in your doubt team? Do you believe that even if the whole world was united in a thought and it was contrary to God, would you know that they are wrong and he is right? Would you be confident of that? We have to guard ourselves. I notice all the time, more and more, that the church appears to be more influenced by the culture than the church is influencing the culture as we're supposed to. I see and hear professing Christians all the time making worldly arguments that are actually contradiction to God's word. And that tells me something. It tells me that they're relying more on the actions and the stances of the majority. The majority of men who we've already concluded here by Paul that they are liars. Instead of what God has said and declared in his word. That's always true. And the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to believe God or not? Are we going to believe in His promises or not? There, there's so many things out there that we have to deal with that, we're, that we, we are tempted to be molded by the culture in. Ideas, ideologies, philosophies. I mean, if, if you turn on the news, you're getting bombarded with, with social justice garbage all the time. And the church can be guilty of starting to, to believe those narratives. Instead of looking in Scripture and seeing God's justice, they, they start believing a, a skewed idea of justice that's really satanic and, and, and full of Marxist ideologies. Or, or what about with homosexuality? The, the, the church begins to, to believe some of the narratives that exist out there about that particular sin that's in the propaganda so instead of believing what God has said in His Word, they start believing in what I call rainbow flag propaganda. Or, or this issue with transgenderism. I mean, are we going to believe what God says in Genesis 1 and 2, that God made them male and female? Or are you going to be influenced by what the world is saying? Or what about even biblical roles of men and women? Are you going to believe what God has clearly revealed about specific roles for men and specific roles for women that's in Scripture that is plainly and clearly taught? Or are you going to be molded and conformed by living your life and arranging your family based upon what you see from the carnal world around you instead of what God has said in His Word? We know that what God says is true and right. He has designed us. He's designed us male and female. He's designed the family. So the question is, you're going to be conformed and listen to satanic lies, feminist propaganda. You're going to believe that masculinity is toxic, or you're going to believe in a biblical masculinity that is called out for in Scripture. These are all things that we're forced with. The world creates their counter-morality. Are we going to believe in God's morality as He reveals in His Word or the world's morality? Listen, the world is going to oppose what Scripture says. The world is going to object. The fallen carnal heart cannot stand the truth of God's Word. They are going to make accusations. This world is full of scoffers and it is full of mockers. Let them not shake our confidence in God's word.
Let them not sway our convictions. Let us not shrink back. Because even if the whole world opposed us, we're still in the majority if we stand with God. For we must understand that even the whole world one day will unite against God. In Psalm chapter 2, we see this reality of this rebellion, and we see God's response to it. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel against Yahweh and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. And then there's God's response. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. How about we start believing God, who is the majority of one? And I just want to leave you this morning by reading the promises given to those who love and trust in His infallible Word. It is Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh. In his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, certainly, your word is powerful. And it is not like anything else in the whole world. And we understand that in it is life, that in it is all the things that we need to know to live a godly life, that's profitable for our teaching that's profitable for rebuking, that's there and sufficient so that we may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Father, I pray that our confidence would, would sit greatly with you and thus in your word, what you have said. Father, I pray that we would not flounder, that we would not be that would not cause us to, to not be trusting in, in your truth, but that we would be believing it. And in believing it, that we would find great rest in it. That we would use it to order our lives. That we'd understand that everything that you say is true. And that your promises will never fail. Father, I pray that as we go out into this fallen world, when we see the whole world seemingly falling apart around us, I pray that we would feel fixed and anchored because we know what is true, because you have revealed it to us in your word. Father, be gracious to us today, and I pray we might find great rest in the Lord Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we close.